Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Hello and welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. Uh, today's episode is going to be a little bit different and I just want to kind of give everyone a primer before jumping into it. Um, the story is that uh, we were fortunate enough to get some time um, with Red Wings lead announcer and, and I mean, Red Wings fans will know who Ken Daniels is and uh, we were very fortunate to, to steal some of his time the other night uh, and we were anticipating an interview um, as time allowed to just uh, fit into this next episode. And what transpired was an uh, amazing, nearly hour and a half long conversation with Ken that we felt was, you know, such a phenomenal interview and uh, had such fantastic stories that it warranted its own episode. So uh, what we're doing is just giving you the entire interview, that conversation, conversation as its own standalone episode, because we feel like uh, it deserved it. And, and Ken, especially for giving us uh, such incredible um, insight and stories and, and information, of course, about the Jamie Daniels Foundation. We want to give that the respect it deserved. So uh, fret not, we'll be back to regularly scheduled programming uh, on Sunday. Uh, we'll get back into doing overtime. Uh, we'll make a Patreon exclusive uh, for you patrons who may not have been able to ask questions today. But uh, again, uh, this is a really fantastic interview with, that we're excited to um, have you listen to. Uh, so thank you again to uh, Ken Daniels for taking the time. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Winged Wheel Podcast first ever interview with Red Wings lead announcer uh, from Valley Sports Detroit, Ken Daniels. Enjoy. So we've had uh, guests on this podcast before, some really big names. I think the day we did Nick Littstrom, that was huge for us. We were probably shaking, asking the questions. Had Darren McCarty on, uh, had Ron McLean on. But I have to say, this is the first time we're interviewing someone who I have a bobblehead of in the podcast studio. So that's got to be a first. Ken Daniels, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here, and I wore this just for you guys, you Canadians. What a boot it. And that, that bobblehead, as much as I tried to get the hair changed, doesn't look anything like me. But, you know, for, for Mick, you can do a bobblehead. It's easy. You got the mustache. You got the gray hair. Me, they, you know, whatever. It's okay. But that, that I got to tell you, that raised about $80,000 for the foundation. And, and wow. God bless Mickey because he signed, must have been 2,000 of them. That, that were the ones that sold, uh, the signs. So, uh, God bless him. It was a lot of fun. It was wonderful. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, he signed them because they, they did such a good job with his face. That's why. Yes. Yeah, exactly. down and everything. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so Ken, we have a world of questions we'd love to ask you, uh, but let's just open up with, uh, the most important thing here. Um, the listeners of this show will know that, uh, we've been very proud to say that we, we support the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Jamie Daniels Foundation and the work that you're doing. Well, and just, uh, I guess it started in 2018. Uh, so just around three years, it'll be coming up, uh, I guess later this month. Uh, we've raised uh, just over a million dollars and I got to say you guys and Prashanth and what, what you guys did and, and the lack of power play success and what else you've done has been, um, has been remarkable just how it caught on. We didn't ask for any of that, but it's generosity of you guys. And I don't know whether it has to be being dual or whatever, uh, that Canadian thing. But so many people have been so giving. So we've raised just over a million dollars. We're looking to build long term safe sober living in Oakland County. And we're getting there, just going through the government process now. Uh, you notice I said process and not process. And uh, hopefully by November of next year, we'll have a, um, a shovel in the ground. That's the goal we're going to have to by then. And uh, it'll be a, a great place. It'll have 80 units uh, in conjunction with the Recovery High School, be the first of its kind in the United States. 80 units, people can live there um, as long as they need to based on market rate. We'll have job placement there. We'll have art therapy, music therapy. Uh, it's uh, on an 80-acre facility, so we're hoping to have a driving range. Uh, those who are addicted, those who are in recovery need direction every day. And when Jamie got patient brokered, sought out and uh, met with the legal activity in Florida, which ultimately cost his life, and it's still going on, even though Jamie's mom and I have spoken before Congress to get laws changed, and they have. It's still too easy to build the insurance industry and open up a so-called sober living home. So in our facility, 80 units, 50 will be drug court mandated rather than incarceration. 
uh, still with uh, officers uh, monitoring their progress and going for drug testing. Uh, and 50 of those will be through drug courts and another 30 units will be for those like Jamie who are never arrested. But if you're addicted and in recovery, uh, the worst place one can go is to be at home because of the uh, judgment that is still put on by parents, obviously, because they're unsure and the questions. Um, you're best to be out with your peers and uh, recovering and having a job, living on your own and looking after yourself. Um, so that's the goal of the facility. So uh, for, for the foundation right now, as well as we have the Jamie Daniels Memorial Scholarship at uh, Michigan State University. We're looking to get into other colleges. And for those at Michigan State who have to leave, go into recovery, will offset what they need. And uh, there's a, a floor of a dorm that is safe, sober living and sober tailgating. And yes, there is such a thing. So, uh, you know, we're looking to get in other colleges. We've, we've helped the Edsel Ford High School, um, and ninth graders. We've given them a grant of upwards of 50,000. So we're spending the money to help others and, um, and your contributions go toward that. So we thank you. And, um, just to recognize the listeners here, um, and for you, Ken, a little bit of background. Obviously, we're just starting out with this. So we thought, let's see what we can do just as an initial fundraiser. So we thought maybe we can just pull together a thousand dollars. And with the help of our friend Everett Johnson, we thought we'll match a thousand dollars. And the uh, listeners within, an, uh, I think three hours matched that. And in the end, ended up raising an additional $4,500 uh, for the foundation. So for all of you, um, you heard just now from Ken, what your, uh, your contributions are going to. So kudos to you. And uh, Ken, my question to you is, what does it mean to have seen the Red Wings community, the Red Wings fan base, uh, really get on board with the Jamie Daniels Foundation with this, you know, full on support? Well, it helps so much to those families who are struggling. Alex Saints Foundation, I just spoke there on, on Saturday night, um, that, you know, it's the shame and stigma that can preclude recovery. So we need to talk about it and we can talk about that dreaded disease, cancer, or anything else below the shoulders and anything that happens, we don't talk about it. And when it's above the shoulders, uh, we, we talk about anything below the shoulders and not above the shoulders. And I, I almost like to, if we could change the process, the thought process to, to make it brain wellness. We always say mental illness. Let's make it mental wellness. Let's make it's, it's a mental, there is a mental illness. There is a disease there, but let's talk about brain wellness. Um, and let's end that stigma that is attached to this. So the more we talk about it, the more the Red Wing community gets involved. We're not hiding behind it. And as a family, you know, we did. Uh, Jamie didn't want anyone to know what was going on with him when he went to recover in Florida. He was seven months sober. He was studying for his LSATs. He was working at a law firm and then got patient brokered into a home that he shouldn't have, was enticed to go there. And then a so-called addiction doctor that he was referred to by that not sober house put him on Xanax and no recovering addict should be on Xanax. And then he took something that he shouldn't have because he was feeling good about himself in that home and it was laced with fentanyl. And then he died. Uh, just a speck of fentanyl, which is everywhere, uh, goes into a pill. It'll kill you. And that's what it did to him. So the more the community talks about it, because if it's not happening in your home, God bless you. But it's probably happening two or three doors down. So what the Red Wing community is doing, and the more people talk about it, even saying the Jamie Daniels Foundation, and we're not ashamed of saying it. And it took me nine months. It took me nine months until Craig Cussens, love him, from The Athletic. And he did an interview with me about my book. It's behind me up there if these walls could talk. And at the end of the interview, Craig said to me, um, how you doing? And it wasn't like Joey from Friends, how you doing? It was how you doing? And there was a voice in the back of my head that said, it's, it's okay, dad. It's okay. And I told Craig the story and no one really knew. I mean, yeah, people could assume you overdose, you died in his sleep, of course, but no one really knew the story. And even my family didn't know. When Jamie was in recovery in Florida, he'd call them, talk to them. They, they didn't know he was in We just said he was working in Florida. They didn't know. Jamie wanted no one to know. And this is why people need to know. So you're not doing it alone. And even as a family. So when I told Craig the story, and then he wrote about it, and then ESPN E60 did a feature on it. And then people see that in the U.S. government. And then we go speak before Congress. So little things like that happen along the way. So what Red Wing community is doing... The more you talk about it, and I speak to so many who've reached out to me in the Red Wing community and say, I know this person is struggling. I know this person. And we have people at jamiedanielsfoundation.org. If you go on our site uh, and go to the help section, it'll have questions to ask because Jamie's mom and I had no clue when Jamie said, Dad, I need to go to rehab. Where do you go? 
We had no idea in 2015. We didn't know about patient brokering. We didn't know about fentanyl. We didn't know about anything like that. So, and all the places to go in the United States that we believe, there must be a dozen on there, that have been vetted and are safe. And at some point here, out of recovery, out of detox, 30-day detox, we will build our house. That'll be a safe place to live. So, the Red Wing community has been wonderful. It's just about spreading the word. And that's what we're doing. Well, I think I can safely speak for the Red Wing community that we're always happy to help. Um, whenever possible, just because the years of joys and, and laughs you've brought to all of us through Red Wings games uh, is, you know, more than made up for it. So, but I do want to kind of transition into talking about you a little bit more because reading into the early parts of your career, your your career arc is really fascinating because you went from a referee to working low level broadcasting to Hockey Night in Canada. What seemed like that, and then in '97, I believe it was, is when you transitioned over to the Red Wings. How did that all happen in such a relatively short amount of time? How can I condense it in a relatively short period of time? Uh, although it's all out in my book, um, I, I, I could sum it up by saying, as a ten-year-old going to sleep, I don't know if you can see over over my left shoulder. There's a, a yellow. Radio, it's a yellow, you see that yellow? It's a, it's a transistor radio. It's a twist radio, yellow Panasonic radio. I went to sleep with that radio underneath my pillow listening to Foster Hewitt, um, when I was eight, nine, ten years old. And I fell asleep listening to Foster. Don't forget all the games were on TV then and the Leafs were on the, the West Coast because back then, uh, 67 Leafs last cup. So shortly thereafter, they expanded to 12 teams in the league. So you're playing on the West Coast, the Oakland Seals. Or Oakland Golden Seals, whatever, with the white skates. And uh, I'd fall asleep listening to, to Maple Leafs hockey with Foster. So I literally dreamed my jaw. Literally. I know kids like to say literally all the time. I literally did. I fell asleep listening to Foster. Um, I can't get over how much Evan looks like Shea Weber. Holy crap. Oh, <laughs> my God. We've been that... saying that from day one with Evan. Honest <laughs> to God. It's scary. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. So, um... So I, I, and then at age 17, just wanting to do it and reading in the toilet out loud on the newspaper. Remember when there were newspapers? Uh, there still are. But, uh, I'd, I'd read my mother would walk past old Ken's trying to be on the radio again. And then I got a job at a cable company doing a Metro Toronto Hockey League weekly show. Didn't last very long. Um, but I did that just to be on TV, on cable television. Then I wrote Brian Williams. You know, Brian Williams, the Dean of Canadian Broadcasting, that Brian Williams and, and CBC, then TSN. And I wrote Brian a letter at 17. He said, come on down, watch me do the sports. He called me home, never skip, forget. My mother said, Ken, Brian's on the phone. And a copy of the letter he wrote me is in my book. And I went down and watched him. And as a 17, 18 year old, I'd call Brian every six months. And he'd say, well, I've got nothing for you now. Give me a call next month. Like he was going to get me a job, right? He wasn't. But here's the funny thing. So I went to York University that Brian told me to do, get a degree in your BA, you know, English, poli sci, whatever. And I did that and then called people, called people I knew who had people in the business, gave me numbers of other people till finally somebody hired me in Oshawa. So work in Oshawa, then go to Toronto and radio overnight and then do City Hall and Queen's Park. And then, hey, Ken, you know sports. Can you fill in for the sports guy? And I did all that. So it's just versatility. But when I finally got into TV because it was, I was working radio still, wasn't in television yet. And, uh, so it would have been, I don't know, 1985 or so. And I had a, a media pass working in radio for the Toronto Blue Jays. Friday night, I didn't have a date. What a loser. So I didn't have any food in my house except for Twinkies, you know, bachelor, early twenties. What the hell? So I went down to the Blue Jay game to get dinner and I ran into Don Martin. You remember Don Martin, CBC Television, then went to Global after Hebsher and Taddy? Are you guys too young? I'm not so sure. I but, vaguely remember him. Do you? Okay. So Don was there, and I'd met Don a few times just from, you know, radio and, and going down, whatever, at news conferences, press conferences, things. And Don said, hey, Ken, I'm leaving for the Canada Summer Games. Do you want to fill in for me on TV? And I said, are you shitting me? Seriously? And he said, call Howard Bernstein, the exec producer at CBC. So I did. He answered the phone on Monday. I went in an audition with another guy from Montreal over the course of the next two weekends. I wasn't very good. I'd never done TV before, reading off a teleprompter. wasn't good, but I did it. I had done radio for years, so I knew how to take cues, et cetera. And they hired me. 
and I did weekends and they hired me full time. And then to the point of my story is a year later, uh, well, when they hired me full time, I get into the office. Now, Brian Williams had gone on to network TV. So they needed another guy to, to fill out their, their three man sports team. So Brian had left to do national CBC, he left local. And I'm in the office and I answer the phone one day and a kid calls me, calls me next week. I said, give me a call in a few weeks. And Bill Lawrence, do you remember Bill Lawrence, the weatherman? Maybe not. But Bill hosted uh, Tiny Talent Time, which is like the American Idol stuff, you know, but it was a Canadian version. They were younger kids. So he hosted Tiny Talent Time. He was the weatherman. Greatest, nicest man I've ever met in my life. And I answered the phone, talked to this kid, and I said, give me a call next month. And Bill Lawrence says, you know, you're just like Brian. I have no idea how many kids Brian Williams told to call him next month and keep in touch with him. I said, I was one of those kids. And I replaced Brian locally. And a year later, I replaced Brian at CBC Sports Weekend on National Sports for uh, Formula One racing in IndyCar. And uh, that's how it goes. So, yeah, it may have seemed quick, but it was over a course of, uh, you know, seven or eight years in there and working national sports and ultimately doing Leaf Radio and then go to host Hockey Night. And then John Shannon came to Hockey Night in Canada in 93 or 94 and said, um, I'd like to put you on play-by-play movie from hosting to Hockey Night. He liked my play-by-play. I met John once. It's about people you know, right? You meet people on the road and you never know. And John Shannon, my mentor, was um, producing Minnesota North Stars game and Dave Hodge was the play-by-play. So I was filling in for Joe Bowen on Leafs Radio. We were in Minnesota at the old Met Center with all those multicolored seats when Borea Salming was there with the Leafs, et cetera, and, and Eddie O and Gary Lehman and all those guys. And we went out for a drink because we weren't flying right after games all the time. We'd stay over. And uh went for a drink one night, didn't know John, just took a liking to me and then heard my call. Ultimately, you know, he's then, you know, a few years later coming to Hockey Night in Canada where he was before coming back and wanting me to do play-by-play on TV. And that's how it happened. So how'd you go from CBC to the Red Wings then? You know, what was that? Maybe a couple of years later at that at that point? Like those seem sort of two mutually exclusive sort of markets and areas. I'm just wondering what the genesis of that was. Well, the genesis of that was I was doing the um, – First round playoff series between Buffalo and Ottawa in 1997 for Hockey Night in Canada. Uh, that would have been the year that the Red Wings won the Cup, 96-97, the first of, of the back-to-back. I didn't come to the 97-98. So I'm doing uh, Hockey Night in Canada playoffs. First round, Ottawa-Buffalo goes seven games. Um, and then goes to round number two when Buffalo won uh, in game seven, goes on to play Philadelphia. So I'm back in Buffalo for the second round series for Hockey Night. And... Uh, the late, great Dave Strader walked into the booth. I'd met Mickey a couple of times beforehand. And so it would have been May of 97. And Dave said to me, they're letting the guy go in Detroit who replaced me. Mickey wants you to send your tape in. I said, okay then. And there was a, didn't have my cell phone with me. Greg Millen and I, my broadcast partner, were driving from Buffalo to Toronto and back, right? Um, and after games, he had a driver and I went out to the telephone booth and I called my agent, told him the story. That telephone booth, by the way, is still outside the press box booth when we go to Buffalo. <laughs> so Mickey and I actually years ago took a picture in front of it. It's the booth that, uh, helped get me my job. So I called my agent, put some tapes together. I sent them into the Red Wings. Now, you know, this was May. I had went, I went down and interviewed with the Red Wings in June with Atanas Illich and, and the late Toby Cunningham was there. F- Pass was just coming over to Fox. So John Tui was there and with Mickey. So I interviewed, didn't hear anything. And then the limo crash. So I thought, my goodness, I'm so far down on their thought process. This is going to be a long time. So it comes to early September. I go for dinner with John Shannon. I haven't heard through my agent anything from the Red Wings. And, uh, John said, um, well, I'd like you to stay with Hockey Night in Canada. And we agreed on a handshake deal for three years to stay with Hockey Night. And he was going to try to get me more games. You know, they, Bob Cole was there at the time. I think it was Chris Cupper could have still been there. And Hugh, I'm not, I'm not sure who was there, but oh, Don Whitman still there. So the pecking order, 
I was still like the fourth guy, right? It was going to be a long time. Bob Cole, what, retired three years ago, would have still been waiting. At any rate, um, and then the next day, just as the press release is coming out that I'm staying with Hockey Night in Canada, Rob Longley, uh, Tom McKee from the Toronto Star, Rob, Rob Longley from the Toronto Sun call me. In the midst of all that, I get a phone call uh, from my agent that the Red Wings made me an offer. Go, Holy crap. Wow. Then I wasn't really happy with the offer because it was just a two-year deal. And I just agreed with John Shannon. Now I'm going, what the hell do I do? Then I get a phone call after I turn it down a, a few minutes later from Arthur Smith. So here's what goes around, right? Arthur Smith was my Olympic boss with CBC Television. I did two Olympics, uh, 88 in Seoul, 96 in Atlanta. So just done the Olympics in Atlanta. Arthur Smith had just left to head up Fox in Los Angeles. Uh, I, Arthur calls me and berates me. Do you know how hard I worked to get you to Detroit and you turned down the offer? Of, so he gets on the phone with my agent. 15 minutes later, the phone rings. The Red Wings up the offer, longer term deal. I said, give me a minute. So I called John Shannon and Greg Mellon's at John's house. I'm literally, again, I'll use literally, but it's literal now, uh, in tears on my front porch in my Toronto home because I didn't know what to do. You got a one and four year old, you're moving your family. It's scary, right? Didn't know. And it's a new situation. I'm in now with hockey night, waiting my turn. And I called John and John said, see ya. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I can maybe out of 27 weeks for hockey night in Canada, and they were going to double headers. But he said, I can't give you every week. I can maybe give you 15 weeks in a playoff round. The only way you're going to get really good is to do 80 games a year. So he said, you got to go. And to this day, I thank him lots and we talk lots. And, uh, you know, the roast we did virtually last year, Scotty Bowman, John Shannon, put it together with Dave Hodge, did all the links in Toronto, and we still talk a lot, and uh, he should still be in the business. He is, sort of. But, you know, he does a podcast now with Bob McCowan, and, you know, and is uh, active on social, et cetera, and is no longer with Hockey Night. But uh, I own a lot, so it's been great. And then with, with Mick, what what can you say? It's been a, a, been a fun ride. So you mentioned that you came in uh, in 97, and obviously at the tail end of everything that happened with the limo crash, the next dozen years or so represented some of the most impactful years of any franchise in professional sports. What was it like to be, you know, the voice and, and the face of that team's broadcast uh, during that time? It's a lot easier than losing. People like you more. <laughs> All of a sudden, the games are better. You don't suck as much. And this was before social media, too, so I really won. In all ways, you don't really know who hates you, at least not publicly. Uh, it was good. I remember that first year because uh, Sergei Fedorov, you know, with the deal with Carolina and, and matching the offer sheet and all that crap that went down. And as good as the Red Wings were coming off the cup, um, and I went to my first training camp. And the first guy I actually met, the first guy when I drove to Detroit in my old Honda Civic without without any um, air conditioning, first guy when I'm Joe Louis Arena parking lot I saw trying to find my way and going to meet Ted Spears who had helped hire me, um, was Steve Eisenman in the parking lot. I'd met him once before, not that he would have known who I was and introduced myself. And he was the first guy I met uh, coming to Detroit. So at that time, not seeing Fedorov, for those when it starts and the Red Wings are still winning, Mickey says, wait till you get a load of this guy night in and night out. Or you ever get even more spoiled. Then you win a Stanley Cup that year and you're spoiled. And I got a picture in my office of Mickey and, and me and I were flying home on the extra plane that the Redbird won and the Red Wings for family. And we're flying home with the Stanley Cup sitting between us. I mean, holy cow. That was pretty cool to be spoiled right off the bat like that. And uh, then I had to wait till 0-2 to win another one. But, you know, to get a Stanley Cup ring your first year, even though I had nothing to do with it, nor have anything to do with any of them, except be a part of it uh, from afar, uh, That that's pretty cool. So the first thing you said after that question was, it's better to be winning. It's better when you're winning because people like you more. I yeah. would almost argue the inverse because over the last few years, we all know what's been going on with the Red Wings and some games are enjoyable to watch, some aren't. But the one thing, especially towards the end of the season that I noticed on social media really brought Red Wings fans together was the banter between you and Mickey. The stories he's telling, the the conversations you guys are having as the play is going on, if it's, you know, a, a big lead for the other team. And it's 
objectively a terrible game to be watching for a Red Wings fan, but we're all loving the hell out of it because of you two. Understanding where the Red Wings are at in their rebuild, is this something you and Mickey plan on during the game? Like, hey, if it gets bad, let's maybe, you know, kind of do a bit more of this banter, or is this just something that happens completely organically between you two? Organically. Completely. We've never talked about that. We know what we're doing. We know, and it's been five years of practice now. We're getting good at it. Um, no, we, we know what we're doing, but it, no, it's never been said, boy, we got to talk about this. I mean, when it's nine o'clock on a Saturday and the guy starts singing, what are you going to do? I'm like, you know, it just happens. It's, it's all organic. Um, we knew, I remember, I remember a few years ago, uh, when they were in the midst of the rebuild, even though, Kenny and I talked about it, Kenny Holland and I, that it should have started earlier than it did, but going into the new building in, what was it, 17? Is that right? 17, 18, 18, 19, 19 or so, or getting there. Um, 17. It probably should have started earlier than it did, but going into new building, and I always argued with, with Ken that that's the point. You're going into new building. The building will distract what's going on in the ice for a few years. You can start it earlier. But he held on, in fairness to Datsuk or Zetterberg, whatever, and Add on in hindsight, 2020, even though we hate to say 2020 now. Um, in hindsight, you'd rather not have done that, but he did. Um, but I remember in Ken's last year, I had spoken to him about our group going to Grand Rapids, needing discussions with him, doing features. We need to know about the draft potential in the draft and get footage from elsewhere. And he said, yeah, you're going to need some kind of shit to throw on in intermissions, aren't you? And I go, you got that right. Yeah, we do. So that was all sort of, we knew not to distract. Red Wing fans aren't stupid. They're smart. You're not going to fool anybody, but there's a way to say it. We're not going to say a guy sucks or whatever, but you know what it is. And Mickey, I think, will point it out. Yeah, are we homers? Sure, to some extent. Do we want the home team to do well? Sure. But the one thing I will never do and never have done, like some around the league will do, and I I point out the Avalanche guys, because not so much the newer guys, but it's driven me crazy. When the opposition scores, and I remember, oh, it was maybe five or it was, I was in my other house. It was seven years ago now. I remember I was watching a Colorado game and I left the room. Only my kitchen was 20 feet away. And I came back in. I said, when did they score? Whoever they were playing. I can't remember. And I rewound it. And the call was scores. I'm, Are you kidding me? That's a disservice to the game, in my opinion. So people say, you get excited sometimes when the other team scores. No, I get excited because I love the game. And there's a passion for the game. That's what it's about. And there's a Red Wing level when I say scores, and there's an opposition level when I say scores. It'll never meet the Red Wing level because just naturally it won't. Because that's not how I am. But there's a natural path to the game. Now, if somebody scores late in the game, you think you have it won, they pull the goalie, tie it up. Sure, it's maybe an octave lower than that. But I'm never going to do a disservice to the game. So to that end, we're not fooling Red Wing fans. We're just not. We know what it is. You try to talk about what's coming in the future. And that's the truth. We do. Is the team now good? No, it's not. Uh, who are you going to leave exposed in the draft? We know. I, I'm close enough with Danny to Kaiser, but it's just the, the obvious thing because the games have been met and who's going to be exposed is just the way it is. It's a business. They're making good money. They understand. That's the unfortunate part. We hate talking about guys who are going to be traded. Not so much unfair to them. It's unfair to anybody. If you're in that situation, I know many of the players' wives, and I'll see them out. And I, I, I feel terribly talking. they got a family, and they're moving. And we, we have to understand that part of it. It's easy for us. Like, oh, they're making $4 million. They're making $6 million. Wouldn't we love to? Yeah, we would. But there's still another side to it that's hard. So we take that into account. You take that into account when you're talking about the team. You're not going to rip anybody. But I think we're fairly honest. And we try to put a positive spin where you can, but not a positive spin where you're lying and fooling people. At least we hope not. We've um, asked this to former players who are on the 2002 team just kind of talk about what that it was like being on a basically an all-star team. Um so loaded with talent. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything about that team that sticks out to you since you have a slightly different perspective than former players might. Any interesting stories from from that team? Well, yeah, that I remember our first regular season game because we only did preseason games. We do three a year normally. 
Thank God they're being cut back. We only do uh, three preseason games a year. Um, they're all at home, obviously. Maybe we did one in Toronto or something. I'm probably not that year, though. And, and those last, remember we used to play eight or nine games and the last two were against the Leafs? Well, those were gone anyway this year, and then it didn't happen, but um, those are gone. So um, fewer games, and I remember sitting on Redbird for that first game on the road, and, and we sit, I sat toward the front just behind management there. And, uh, you know, you just see the group. Now, you know Shanahan and Eisenman, but on comes Robitaille. And on comes Hull. And on comes Hoshik. I just said, seriously, I said, holy shit. This is, this is unbelievable. So you knew. And then you go through the season. It's incredible. It's a lot of fun. And then you get to the playoffs and you're down. It was 2 to Vancouver, right? And uh, I remember we went on the road after down 0-2. And we park our cars at the airport and we get on the plane onto Redbird and uh, Ken Holland and Scotty are already seated. And I happen to walk on right behind Steve and Eisenman turns. Well, I didn't have to turn Kenny and Scotty sat right across from one another. And uh, Steve says, we're not losing this series. And he walks to the back of the plane. I felt a hell of a lot better. I really did after that. And then we land in Vancouver late in the morning, and you know, the Bertuzzi, Naslin, Morrison lines going all guns and whatever. And uh, we land, and there's three cars of idiots, I guess, following our team bus from the airport all the way back to our hotel, downtown Vancouver. And they got the Vancouver Canuck flags out, 02, Red Wings suck, this and that, and this, the bus was quiet. And I'm sitting right behind Kenny Holland, as I did for all those years on the bus. And... Uh, Kenny says, uh, turns to me and he says, this is perfect. And I said, yeah, it is. They heard it. Four straight after that. And the funny thing was, I remember the other story, was uh, sort of practice the next day or the next day of the morning skate. And uh, Scotty wants to go. You know, now the coaches, they're never with the bus coming back. At least not usually. They're, they're either staying or gone or everybody leaves and the bus is going back, you know, for lunch with the team. And we're missing somebody. And the guy's yelling, wait, wait, wait. Scotty was, let's go, let's go, let's go. And uh, John Hahn was our PR guy at the time. And uh, John yells to the back, who are we missing? They said, Dom. And Scotty says, okay, you can go get him. <laughs> so, Hoshik, we had to wait for the bus for Hoshik. <laughs> yeah, you might need that guy. Might need that guy. So we're on, not that he couldn't have grabbed a cab. It was before Ubers, but anyway. So we're on our way back to the hotel. And, uh, and he turns to Mickey and me and he says, uh, so you guys think, um, Bertuzzi, Naslin, and Morrison are pretty good, huh? I said, well, first few games, I guess they're doing okay. So why? He goes, well, Mr. I thinks you do too. So Mickey lets out Mickey Chortle. He starts laughing. <laughs> then Kenny laughs. But I think for the next four games, I'm not sure I ever had Bertuzzi, Morrison, or Naslin touching the puck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, I got the message. That but, one's coming down from the top. Yeah. But in all the years, you know what? Mr. I never said anything to us about how we called the game. Always loved us. Um, you know, whenever I saw Mr. I, he just loved it. So that was as close as it ever came. And I'm not sure he ever even told Kenny to say, tell those guys. I think he just said, boy, they are. So Kenny decided to pass it on in Kenny's own little way to get the message across. Message accepted. Well, that was one thing I wanted to ask was, did, has anybody ever, like you guys have been doing this for quite a long time. Has anybody 20, ever. Going into a 25th year there, Shea Weber. Going into a 25th year. <laughs> matter of fact. Mickey and I are the longest serving current TV duo in the National Hockey League. And knock wood, we hope it lasts a And it's time. well deserved. But I was just wondering if anyone that ever sort of pulled you guys aside at a commercial break or something and said, you know, you guys like, t no, nothing? Nothing. Never. Well, that... Never. Ever, ever, ever. Well, ever. you guys are untouchable then. Not all about that. I, I, you know, <laughs> the nobody is. But... No one's ever said a thing. As a matter of fact, I, I think they're happy with how what you guys mentioned earlier, how we're doing the game. They know. They know there's got to be something of a distraction and a future to look forward to. And we're not hiding that. And we hope we bring entertainment. 
I think every night when Mickey and I go on the booth and during commercials and we laugh, we know the state of the team. But if you can't have fun and be in a good mood, and believe me, this year was a test like no other, calling it out of our Bally Sports Southfield Studios, when it's just Mick and me, uh, and either Paul and Mike, our stats guy, and Chucky, our floor guy, um, that's it. We're in a studio, and our producers and directors are across the way, and you're calling it off a 70-inch television monitor. Even when I did uh, Carolina Nashville for NBC. We're in soundproof booths in, in Stanford, Connecticut. I'm calling it with AJ Malesko is in a booth across from me through a window. I can see her and I'm in a much smaller booth than a studio that we had at, at Bally Sports. And during the intermission, I come out because our game had already begun. We're after one and I come out and there's Pierre Maguire and Alex Faust who are calling uh, the St. Louis, Colorado, St. Louis, Colorado, uh, off a of TV too. We're shooting the breeze in the intermission. It's just crazy what a world it was. None of us traveled. So the players that we've had this year, uh, the new guys, Troy Stetcher, other guys, Bobby Ryan, whether he stays, uh, you know, Merrill, I've never seen them. I haven't met them. I knew Sam Gagne a bit, and I did a Zoom call with him after, so we spoke. But you, And I'm not, you know, guys around the league are the same thing. We have never met these guys. And that's when you lose that. So, you know, this year was like no other. You lose that intimacy. So even when we're talking about the guys, there's no guilt feelings talking when somebody's feeling, you know, as bad as this year was, although better than last. Um, You haven't met anybody. You know, you're just hoping for the best. This was just a a, a crazy, crazy year. But I I think um, no one said a thing to us. I think they, they understand, they get it. No one says anything. No news is great news. Well, kind of branching off that, because obviously over the past handful of years, we had obviously the unfortunate passing of Mr. I, and then a pretty big shakeup in the organization. Kenny goes to Edmonton. Steve Eisman comes in. Obviously, you're really in tune with what's going on around the organization. Has there been any really big changes behind the scenes that you've noticed or felt since this kind of quote unquote new regime has, has got their really put their stamp on this it's a lot tighter even when steve played nothing came out of that room i used to talk about that you know coming from toronto and the toronto media and things that would leak out of the room nothing leaks out of the room and i I should say even from players with kenny it was the same nothing leaked out and i think that comes from the way the leadership was passed down whether it be nick to hank to dylan uh not the players good groups of guys There's been no infighting. Everybody gets along now. Once in a while, you don't get along. And that's okay for a team, too. That shit happens. But none of that has ever happened with this group. And and I know from Steve, it's buttoned down. And that's why he's been as successful as he is. And we don't mind that. So for anyone to say who the Redmond's going to take, how the hell do we know? Did anyone have Mo Sider? I don't know. I think there was one that's scouting on, um, there was one. It's J.D. Oh, Burke who had it a few hours yes. before. Yeah. That's it. He had him there. And I, unfortunately, we did the preview show and I didn't see his, or maybe I would have mentioned his name. But for, you know, and don't ask me who's the, I don't know. I know they're pretty set on defense going forward, but, you know, I think that's pretty good. And you still need some more offense. Obviously, you need help at center. You need help everywhere. You need help in goal, whatever. But what Steve's thinking, we don't know. What Chris Draper's thinking, I know I, I'm doing a call with Drapes, but he's not going to tell me. That's okay. I used to be a broadcast partner with Pat Verbeek. I'm not calling Pat to ask him. He's not going to tell me. And they're buttoned down, and nor should they. And that's, you know, loose lips sink ships. And and that's why Steve Eisenman was successful as he is. You just look at Steve's track record and what he did. I mean, Yanni Gord was a free agent. Tyler Johnson was a free agent. Andre Plott in the seventh round. Braden Point in the third round. Why? Because they were worried he wasn't skating great. They found out the issue with an ankles and the Tampa Bay Lightning worked on it, and all of a sudden he became a fabulous skater. Kucherov picked, what, 58th overall in the second round. Who did the Red Wings take before Kucherov? Yurko, Willette, and Sproul out of the game. All before Kucherov. And I love Xavier Willette. We're tight, and he looks just like my son Jamie. And it's uncanny. So I love him. And you look at uh, Anthony Sorelli in the third round. Um, Kalorn in the fourth round. All these guys, so you, you know, Al Murray, a chief scout, so you have to trust that. 
So behind the scenes to your question, yeah, the Tyler Wrights are gone and Chris Draper comes in and then you got new scouting staff and Hawk and Anderson still there in Europe, of course, but you've got new scouts coming in. You have a new medical team coming in. Um, so yeah, lots of stuff behind the scenes that are very important and management staff and, and Horkoff and, you know, Cleary was there with Kenny, but still elevated. And then Yuri Fisher, what he's doing, Nick Cronwall during this lockout and he's overseas watching these guys, helping these guys and the Swedes and keep an eye on them and mentoring them. So yes, so much has changed behind the scenes with Steve, everything and how it's run. And it's, I think it's fabulous. You just needed it. I mean, Tyler Wright moved on with Kenny. I think that they miss on lots. They did, you know, but then some were pretty good. I mean, Mantha's pick was okay. You can't really argue with it there and then what it turns into, but some they missed on. And even then, and the, you know, that you talk about Kucherov and who that was Jim Nil. You know, that was Jim Nil. That was Joe McDonnell. Those were those guys. Now, Jim Nil drafted him likes of Jason Robertson and others since, and Rupe Hintz. He's done okay in Dallas and he did some great work with the Red Wings too, but it's not an exact science, but you can hit on a number of years. But I think since 2011, did they hit as well as they should have? Probably not. I mean, Dylan Larkin was a fabulous pick. You could say, yeah, 25th, David Pasternak. And I know it was a choice between those two. But, you know, what Pasternak been doing with the Red Wings, if he didn't, he's a great player. He's a great scorer. But he's got Marshawn and Bergeron. So, you know, we needed help down the middle. So who would we have? If you didn't have Dylan Larkin right now, who would you have? So, you know, you can argue some of those. But, you know, there's some good picks and bad picks, and it's not exact, but... I just see what Steve Eisenman did in Tampa Bay, and I go, okay, just have to have the trust. He knows what the hell he's doing. Um, so do many others, but I look at his track record. He came to Tampa, and yes, you had Hedman, and you had Stamkos. But they didn't win for years, and they only won a year ago. It takes a while, and that's the one thing let me say about Ken Holland. The year before he left, and you know he held on to the rebuild too long, and he told the fans at that time, it's 10 years in a rebuild. And people scoffed and they laughed at him and said he was crazy. There are outliers and let's keep Vegas out of it. There are the odd outliers. But it is because if we're in what? I don't know. What are we now in the rebuild? Four, five, four, three? I don't know. How do you want to call it? Yeah, them? I'd give it five. Okay. It's been a and while. <laughs> okay. And you think they're now they're going back in the Atlantic and look at all the teams that are good now that are coming back into the Atlantic. Okay. So what is it? Two to three years to be right there pushing for a playoff spot? Maybe. Then how many more to go? Now you're at seven, eight. Now, you, and when Kenny said 10 years, that's to be competitive every year to win a cup. And let's use Buffalo Sabres as example one. And this is without a number one pick. So I think he was unfairly criticized. Some of his, and the other thing with the draft, Steve will tell you, he might overrule on a pick, but you set what you want, whether it be skill for Steve and character, et cetera. Sure, Ken Holland won a skill too, and they take Yurko and they pass. By the way, they passed on Kucherov because the Russian scout at the time wasn't so sure he wanted to leave Russia and maybe wanted to stay home. That's why they didn't take Kucherov. So that was at the time. So it wasn't like it wasn't discussed. And then making the trade and Steve gets Vasilevsky for Tampa 19th with the Red Wing pick and the Quincy deal. See, everybody wants pullbacks, but I will defend Kenny. And then when he said 10 years rebuild, he's probably bang on, give or take a year. It just should have started a year or two earlier. And he'd probably tell you that too. Well, that is incredible insight. And you know what? I want to inject some fan questions in here. And, and yep. you just answered one from Haroon Khan. Uh, I want to start with one from uh, Everett, who's actually been a big, big um, – you know, he's contributed a lot and helped organize a lot of the support to the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So I want to take the time to recognize him. Uh, his question for you is, you know, growing with his organization, as you've talked about, have there been any players or staff that you've most enjoyed watching grow uh, or you've grown alongside with as uh, with your in your time with the Red Wings? Pavel Datsuk. I mean, I watched every game waiting for him to come over the boards. And, you know, you did when I was watching games and just called a bit of Gretzky, but you'd wait for Gretzky to come over. You wait for Pavel Burry to come over. You wait for the, the great players to hit the ice and see what they're going to do. And my goodness, I would have never watched the Minnesota Wild in a million years. But to watch Kirill Kaprizov, um, just changing that franchise and I hope he can continue to do it. Even Jason Robertson in Dallas. Uh, you see these young kids and what they can do. And there are many others, I believe, in out right now. But 
just watching Pavel and knowing Brett Hall and seeing all the crap that Brett gave to Pavel, <laughs> whose English was probably better than it was, but thank goodness sitting next to Brett, next to Brett, he made like he didn't understand a word he said. But Pavel sat across from me on the plane for a lot of time and uh, just just seeing the mad, you know, he was a magician, as Mickey said. And when I watched him, you know, to phrase Datsuki and Deke and not wanting to overuse it, and you could use it every game, and I tried not to. Um, he's one guy, and even, even Henrik Zetterberg, too, and just the professionalism. And obviously, Nick Lidstrom. I remember doing the game back in 06, it would have been, uh, between the benches. Uh, the first in the U.S. to call a game from between the benches. Chris Cuthbert in Canada had done it a few weeks earlier. And I watched Nick Lidstrom, and I think the pass was up the right wing to Jason Williams. And I'm between the benches, and I see at the left uh, defensive zone corner, and Nick Lidstrom, and I see three Ottawa players between him and Jason Williams. And it must have gone through two pairs of skates and one stick, and right onto Jason Williams' stick going right up the right wing boards right in front of me. And I went, holy crap. Just to see Nick, you know, and, uh, well, left-hand shot, but just to see Nick and the way he'd, he'd throw that puck up. It was amazing to watch him night in and to see maybe two times in all the years that I watched Nick go, whoa, he, you know, boy, he looks slow on that. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was two. He, he was the perfect human. Just so to watch him and, and Pavel and just all of them and, and Brett Hull. I mean, yeah, sure, you take Eisenman and Fedorov and Shannon. I, the list goes on and on. But young player for me would have to be have to be that soon for me i would think we have uh, another question from one of our listeners and uh this might be a hard one to pick from your memory bank but it's favorite mickey redmond story oh god i don't know i don't even know how where to begin how long we on for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how many years uh, of time do we have right now? I think I'll put the my coffee favorite on. Mickey Redmond story, well, you know, Mick has, as David Letterman would say, I wouldn't give his troubles to a monkey on a rock, you know, and, <laughs> and he has, I don't know what the hell that means, but he said it all the time and it just fits Jed Clampett, Mickey Redmond, who I call Jed, Uncle Jed, Beverly Hillbillies, because as strange as you thought Jed was, always the pearls of wisdom. And uh, you can watch the old episodes of the Beverly Hillbillies. Jed was smarter than you thought. And that's Mick. So, um, uh, you know, Mick would bring his Coleman stove on the road or whatever, and we'd cook in his room and we'd go buy steaks and because, you know, he's got celiac disease, unfortunately. So he has to cook his meals and be very careful. And he is, it's a, you know, it's a regimen he sticks to. So we'd go and maybe have a pop in his room or sometimes I'd go out and then come back and we'd have a later dinner in his room and just cook. And that's what I really miss this year. I miss the camaraderie of the crew being part of that, or you, you dump off, you know, chuck your bags and go and, uh, you know, lobby in 10 and go for drinks go for a meal with everybody and we're not going to have that anymore because our crew won't travel anymore directors producers that was coming before covid but it's not going to happen but you know mick often wouldn't go out with us maybe come for one but he couldn't eat out in restaurants uh, unless we found a gluten-free place for him so you know he'd cook in his room and it was one afternoon we come back from the morning skate and we're in columbus and i'm in my room and uh, whenever you wanted to know you didn't need a room number for mickey you just follow the smell of the garlic down the hall from where he was cooking so I hear in the middle of the afternoon in Columbus and I don't nap. So it really didn't matter to me. And I'm just doing notes in my room and I hear the fire alarm going off. I go, oh, Redmond. So sure enough, I open up my door. I walk down the hall and one of the, you know, the hotel personnel is standing. She's a young lady standing outside Mickey's room because I knew he was three doors down from me. And the door is wide open. There's a chair in the doorway. And there's Mick in his underpants, waving the towel over the fire alarm to try to get it to stop. I can I can perfectly <laughs> vision, envision that. For, yeah, I fortunately wish, or unfortunately, I'm not sure. Yeah, I wish I had my phone with me though. I wish I had my phone with me because actually, years earlier, remember the year I, I guess it was '99, we lost at LA. Was it Dead Marsh or whatever? I hated him. But anyway, we lost to Los Angeles. It was a bad penalty, Marty Lapointe. If I remember correctly, playoffs. I have a terrible memory, so I'll agree well, with you. It was Dead Marsh in 2000 against LA. 2000, okay. So we're in LA and we're staying in Santa Monica. And <laughs> Mickey and Scotty and I are down by the pool. It's an off day. And hotel staff comes out to the pool. And the maids are pissed because Mickey's room, well, from the garlic and everything else, they went in there and he cooks in his room. Well, they confiscated all his gear and telling Mickey that he can't cook in his room anymore. 
and he's just pissed and he takes off and, and Bowman and I are sitting there and we're just watching him leave and Scotty goes, tough life, huh? <laughs> yeah, tough life. But Mickey goes running in. Anyway, they made him cook for the rest of that series in the kitchen. So, you know, Mickey would bring eggs. Once in a while, they'd break on the road and he'd get pissed and the milk would spill. I mean, it's not easy being him. And really, you know, I try to help him with his bags and we would and everyone always pitches in. It's But he, he works at it. I mean, he, he loves doing it. And to make the sacrifices, honestly, that he makes to be part of this, again, as I spoke to earlier, that's the passion of the game. That's what you love. And he loves the game. And if you've got the passion, it makes it fun. And, you know, as much as a pain in the ass, that's why he doesn't do all the road games, because it just becomes too much. And um, that's when I can eat a little better when he's not around. But actually, you know, it's like being when you go on a canoe trip, or you're around a campfire. And even though the food may not be great, it tastes better than it probably is. That's how it is in mixed room. And he fries up the onions and we'll cut up the onions and the lemon and the steak and do the whole thing and have a drink. That's what we really miss. And just those hot stoving, as we call it. And, you know, and Kenny Holland would come in or whatever, or the coaches or, you know, just come by and visit. And it's um, it's just a lot of fun. You and Mick, and you mentioned this before, you know, you're the longest standing duo in NHL hockey. You're, you're one of the most iconic broadcasting pairs, I think, in sports right now. And, uh, whenever you hear Mick, you hear Ken. And whenever you hear Ken, you hear Mick. Um, there's a story here from one of our listeners, Arjun, who says, uh, when you were in Ohio, I think, in Columbus, uh, he yelled up at the commentator booth during the intermission and threw up the jersey. He doesn't know if you remember that to sign it. We does that happen lots, but I do remember because Jersey's coming up, sure, yeah. Yeah. Does that happen to you guys quite a lot when you're out now? Do you find that happening more and more? Yeah. No, not not more and more. I mean, we we get jerseys. We used to do, if you remember, years ago until the previous boss at Fox, now Belly, um, put a stop to all our birthday announcements. So because we used to get, you'd have a list of 20 birthday announcements. You know, now we do the odd one if it's team related. I like to get my daughters in there, but generally we don't do them anymore. And I think it sort of stopped when Jean Martineau, who is the long-standing head of communications for the Colorado Avalanche, been there for a long time under Pierre Lacroix and Quebec and whatever. And Jean Martineau would say, "Hey, you know, uh, don't let the birthday announcement get in the way of the game. I got a cousin's cousin's cousin who has a birthday. You care to mention the birthday? Screw off, John. Anyway, that's when I realized it was probably becoming a bit too much. And then at the time, Fox put a, a stop to that. And they were probably right because we'd get notes from so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so to do it. And then if you don't do it, you feel guilty you missed it and they're watching. You know, we get sometimes you get fans over in Brazil or something else or want to say hello to somebody we try, but... And the game's so fast now, and the you know the twenty second hurry up face offs. The ref puts his arm up. You got to make that change. Um, you barely get time to tell stories out of breaks. You're gone for ninety seconds three times a period. You know it's usually the first whistle after fourteen, ten, and six is our commercial breaks. So you know, and then icings come over, and then you can't go to break because you can't take a you don't get a timeout on an icing. You can't go there, and and then all of a sudden they're jammed together. You just got no time, so the game's changed, so we can't do them anymore. But yes, we do get jersey signed, and that's not an issue. And in Nashville too, you're right in the crowd. I do remember in Nashville when that you remember that 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 woman who had the the train whistle that tutu. Yes. Tutu played there and she kept blowing that whistle and she moved around the building. One night she was right in front of us and drove us crazy. We had security move her. Mick did. We want her gone. She's driving us nuts. So, so I thought we could hear that on the broadcast. I'm like, that went away. They must have done something. Well, Tutu left. Well, yo, yeah, oh, during the broadcast, well, that yeah, could, yeah. wasn't as loud, but there was one night, yeah, it was really loud and we got, we got sick of that. So we, we try to do what we can. <laughs> So, obviously, being one of the longest tenured play-by-play announcers in the league, you have called a ton of iconic goals, fights, plays, whatever it might be. Is there one that you focus in on and go, that was my favorite call? Not really. I mean, I remember some, you know, a face-off at center and, and... Zetterberg, Datsuk late in the game against Nashville. Remember Datsuk end to end because probably because it's played so much in the highlights, right? Um, the Datsuki and Deke there. And then the Brett Hall pass against Dallas um, when Pavel pulled it the first time. There's another one on Vokun. 
And then you get Brett Hall at 700 and then Shani goal and Fedorov milestone goal. Cicerelli 600th. I think he was with Florida at the time and I knew Dino well enough. So, um, Eisenman 600. Um, no, just calls like that. And then I, I guess my favorite memory, although, you know, it, it, it was unfortunate that it happened to Ken Cal, who I referred to as Schlepprock because anything bad can happen. It'll happen to him. And he knows it and then lost his voice in 08 in game six. And I got called in to do the radio and then handed it back to Ken to call the final, um, or turned out to be 10 seconds. I wish I'd give it to him at 20 seconds, but it was a little late getting to him, but insisted he call it and he did. So those games more stand out to me. Brett Hall hat trick against Vancouver, you know, too. So not really just one call. I, I remember as the first game of the season, Steve Eisenman scored, I think, with 2.1 seconds left to beat the L.A. Kings. It may have been opening night of a season. That one stands out to me. Um, other than that, uh, Bertuzzi, Todd always gives me crap on a shootout goal because I said that was Datsukian, and he said Pavel stole that move from me. What are you talking about? You know, so different goals like that, different plays, but nothing they all run together if you were to show me oh yeah that one oh yeah that one but that's not bad i think i probably remember 10 that stand out that's you know it's okay but um they're all they're all wonderful in their own right so i think just to wrap up the hockey talk here before we get back to uh the jamie daniels foundation and not that we want with hockey talk if you like you guys have done enough you guys have done lots for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. And when you mention the Jamie Daniels Foundation, trust me, we know it and we love it. So don't worry about that. Oh, we appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you and, and you willing to tell the stories. I'm, fans are going to be going nuts off the inside information. Uh, just on uh, Mick in the uh, in the hotel room with Carla alone. That's going <laughs> to that, be iconic. By the way, that's in my book. So Mick okayed every story I'm telling here. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, in If These Walls Could Talk. Yes. Uh, a question we have here uh, regarding to the goal calls. Everyone asks about, you know, what is your favorite of all time? Is there any one that you wish you could have back or any moment on the broadcast that you wish you would have done differently? One of those, you know, you're in the shower later and you, you finally figure out what you want to say in that argument. You, you know, go back and change it. Uh, no, there's always some where you're as a play-by-play guy. I think any play-by-play guy will tell you, you know, we shoot for the perfect game and I don't think any of us have ever had one. You're always going to screw up somewhere. Um, oh, yeah, some I'd like to have back, sure. Um, national games I've done for NBC where you're not used to two teams. You screw up a player. I think we all miss guys in the game so fast now, and you're so far away in most buildings. I mean, Little Caesars Arena is a great broadcast spot now, but you're always going to miss some guys. And and for those who criticize any of us from their couch, um, you know, it's like the old Jerry Seinfeld thing and the hecklers in the crowd. He said, I'm going to come to your place of business tomorrow, and I'm going to heckle you. See how you do. Like, you've never made a mistake because uh, you're all perfect. I'm not saying you guys, but you know who I'm talking about. So those who will sit there with an egg on their, you know, avatar for, for Twitter, which I'm not on, by the way. Uh, Good for you. you. Great choice. For the best. I never tweeted about Wise. it. Wise. Yeah. I follow it under uh, another name, but um, I've never tweeted because I wouldn't do that because it's not me. And I hate people who hide behind something and will criticize not me, anybody. I, I just hate that shit. It, it's it's awful to me. And this world and what they're going through and what Mark Shifley went through and going after his parents. Who are these people? Seriously, it's a game. I know they make good money, but it's a game. Get over it. You have a right to boo. You have a right to be pissed. But to go after someone's family, their kids, or this guy should be dick. Give me a break. Who are we as a society? That's what pisses me off. And that's why I'm on Instagram. It's a friendlier world. So I'm at Ken Daniels TV on Instagram and I like to post stuff about Mick and the foundation. If I, there's some great old stuff, Mickey on there. If anyone gets a chance to see it or Gordy Howe elbowing me in the face, I like it, but I'm not out there. You know, I try to do on Instagram when the game's on, et cetera, but I'm not given inside info anyway. I don't have a lot of it before a game. And if I do, I'm not telling it or if somebody's hurt, I'm not giving it. So, cause it, you know, to have something charted and go after. I, I, it's, it's not something I need to do. I just wish the world were a kinder place, but unfortunately, um, that's not really where we're going, which I went off on a tangent, but the point of that was what to your question again. What were we talking cares? about? <laughs> I do this all matter. the time. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. But the point of your question was what again? 
uh, if you if there was any call that you oh, could take anything back I'd do over. Uh, yeah, there's always a do over. I say I've never had a perfect game and probably never will. Um, there's always calls you want back. Some you get too excited. Your inflection wasn't right. You were too late. You called it. You know, as, as Doc Emmerich, I don't know if you saw the piece uh, that NBCSN did on Doc Emmerich on his life. And it aired a few months ago. And I've watched it a couple of times. And he got to do the call over on the Patrick Kane Cup winner that it wasn't just him. Nobody saw it go in. Nobody knew. Even the referee. I don't think Michael Layton knew it was in. I, nobody did. And he got to call it over. And did that stick with him for a long time? Sure. Because I'm close with Doc. And by the way, I talked with Doc a few weeks ago. And I said, do you miss it? He said, no. I love watching you and Mickey. And I love watching the games. But the preparation and the travel, no, I still love watching the games, but I don't miss it. I'm quite happy. And that made me really happy. And, you know, Doc hosted our roast to Mickey a couple of years ago. And I just love that guy. I think he's, he's the best. I grew up listening to Dan Kelly for the most part was my idol. And then there's Doc and there's not a kinder, gentler man. So he would like do overs. We all want do overs. Again, we're not perfect. We all screw up. Try to accept it. We didn't go into the game saying, I want to make four mistakes tonight. No. You try, the game is fast, and believe me, with the technology and the composite sticks, it's a hell of a lot faster than it used to be. Pucks fling off crossbars now so quickly, you're going, did the goalie get a piece of that? Watch all these games. You don't know. You're not sure. And you're 150 feet away, and I think the Edmonton building that they just built more recently than not is the worst broadcast spot in the National Hockey League. I couldn't believe they put it that far away. It was horrible. Thank God for the NBC game I did there a few years ago with Ray Ferraro that they at least had me down low. Um, that's, that's a horrible spot. It's a guessing game. I called some games, well, more for NBC than even when the Red Wings were in there rarely at Madison Square, the old Madison Square Garden. You were in another time zone. It's a guessing game. Trust me, you're so far away, you don't know. And then when Tampa Bay Lightning and those god-awful gray jerseys with sort of gray numbers on them, the hell are you thinking? Michigan Tech Huskies, the same thing. I called it, it was like yellow on yellow. I'm going, who thought of these jerseys? Who okayed this? And you're on television. You can't even see the numbers. It's like, I want to just go, oh, he's got it, they got it. He's got it, they got it. I mean, just come on. That's so, why Steve left. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, he may have been there when they put him on. But uh, yeah, and they still wear those. And, and it's funny too, as broadcasters, you go into the building and whether it be Dave Michigan or Dave Randorf and we're calling games off the monitor and Dave will text me this year and he said, by the way, we're wearing the gray jerseys and I go, shit. Because that's what ruins the game for me. When you can't see the numbers. It's hard enough for calling it off the television. Now you give me numbers I can't see. So you're looking through everybody. You're trying to find right shot, left shot to try to distinguish a number if the numbers are close enough. Like I know from doing Washington enough because Orloff skates up the ice so much that, you know, um, when, when you look at 9-8 and you can't see and you're going right, left. So immediately as fast as the game is, you're thinking right shot, left shot. Who's got the number? So I know when I'm watching a game and I hear a play-by-play guy screw up, I have empathy for them because I know. And sometimes when they screw up and I go right shot, left shot, yeah, you got to make that note before because it's so easy to do because a 19 and an 18 and the number crunched, you can't see it. It's just too hard. Well, you brought up Doc Emmerich. Um so I, I want to ask this question, even though we don't want it to happen. As have you or Mickey thought about retirement at any point? The hell am I going to do? I don't know. Maybe you've got a hobby that you haven't told us about yet. <laughs> no, my <laughs> perfect hobby is answer. Golf. My hobby is golf. <laughs> oh, perfect. And I'm still about a 17 handicap. I, if I practice more, I could be better. I have my good days and I have my horrible days. I'm always in uh, when I golf. I'm 92, 93, 88, 87. I mean, that, that's my game. And I, I take lessons from my guy, Andrew Mogg. And he says, you know, if you got out here three days a week to practice, I could have you low 80s. And I said, you're probably right. I just don't like to practice. I like to go play with buddies, have a cigar. And that's what I enjoy. So that's my hobby. Uh, I enjoy reading. There's lots of books behind me that I still have to get to. A lot of them are about addiction. A lot of them are about, I have to finish Eddie Olchick's book, Rick Vibe's book, I read Doc's book. There's a lot of books I, I need to finish. Um, so that's really my hobby now. There's um, during the off season and I'm watching games all the time. So I don't know what I would do. Um, I want to keep going as long as I can because I love it. I love traveling. I like, I hope we still will be able to travel. I know Bally Sports wants us to travel. 
I, it seems to be opening up enough that we'll be able to do that again and be in the buildings, seeing the guys. We'll miss our crew not traveling, but the camaraderie, the morning skate, seeing the other play-by-play guys, talking to them. We talk still now. I'll talk to three or four play-by-play guys during the week just shooting the shit about games going on. You know, like I said to one guy the other night, he said, what are you watching tonight? I said, I'm going to, I'm going to watch the regular season game between Winnipeg and Montreal, then watch a playoff game between Vegas and Colorado, because that's the difference. The Canadian North does that ever suck. And, and, you know, and then you see Vegas and Colorado and you go, holy crap, that's hockey. My God, you can talk systems all you want, but you can't play systems without skill. And I got to tell you, those two teams play a system because they got skill and so can Tampa. And that's what it's about. So it's just fun. I, I, I just love the game. And if I weren't calling it, I'd still be watching it. So why not get in for free to a game I love? And I, I think Mickey, I've often asked Mickey, he's, whether it just be home, he's not, he loves it too much. So good, you know, and whether travel becomes an issue and he just does home games, he'll do home games. So he still loves it. He's still great at it. He still breaks down a game wonderfully and sees stuff that uh, I don't see. And there's an art to that. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Mike Babcock, who I think has really come a long way at NBC. Really good. And, uh, you know, I think Sharpie's been terrific. On I, I told Sharpie when he started there a couple of years ago, I said, you're going to be really good. And he is. And, uh, you know, Patrick's done really well. And I think Keith Jones is fantastic. And hopefully they all, you know, Jones and they catch on with the TNT or ESPN and the rights changing. I personally think NBC does a good job. Some will critique them. I think they do really well. So we all love what we do to stay in the game. And that's why they do it. And that's why we want to keep doing it. As long as they'll have me, I'll keep doing it. Well, I don't think there could have been a better answer for Red Wings fans' ears. Legitimately now, I, I want to ask you one more hockey question before Evan has uh, some stuff about the foundation he's been needling to ask. Um, you, you've you obviously seen the throes of a rebuild. You've seen the highs of you know a dynasty. What's your outlook on this team? You, you know, what message do you send to Red Wings fans who are maybe impatient or, or maybe feeling uncertain about the direction the team is going? I'd say, Well, as Steve said from day one, be patient. You know, I think Brendan Shanahan went into Toronto with Babs at the time and said there will be pain. Well, there wasn't as much pain as they thought there would be because all of a sudden they accelerated, gave a lot of money, and now they're stuck. You know, I think they're still a good team. But the regular season is different than the playoffs. And I, again, I just saw what Steve did in Tampa. Yes, he came with two core pieces, and we don't have that number one pick yet, that core piece. Maybe Sider will be that guy. And whoever they pick six this year, maybe, uh, and maybe going forward, it's, it's Shane Wright. Maybe, I don't know, get lucky finally. At least we didn't drop this year. So I say with all that, the pieces are there. We got a lot of good defense prospects coming. I love watching Niederbach. I love watching Soderblom at six, seven. And he's just got a boy, he protected the puck against because he was so much bigger than the other guys. But when he learns better puck protection, I think I like a Niederbach almost to a, Henrik Zetterberg, maybe not at that same level, but at that age, and I've asked some scouts about that. So again, uh, Tuomisto coming and is a big body and a big defenseman. So I, th- I like the future, but the future is three, you know, be patient for the next three years. Enjoy like Mickey and I are. Enjoy what you're seeing right now in the future with no pressure. And that's where people ask me too, you know, Jeff Blashill, is he coming back? I never thought he wasn't coming back in all honesty. And you're going to bring in a, a new head coach who's only going to raise expectations that are not going to be met. And you put that pressure on. And then all of a sudden, three or four years from now, and now, no matter who's coaching, now maybe you're ready to make the playoffs. And then that coach is ready for a change. Four or five years, you're going to make a change now because they don't last very long. And I know Jeff's going into, what, year six? I think it's perfect. And the kids are progressing. Um, so... You know, I, I, I trust Steve Eisenman and Chris Draper and Horkoff and Cleary. I just trust the guys who are running this organization and from Hawk and Anderson and overseas and the scouting staff they have in place. So be patient. Enjoy it. See the growth of Zadina coming. See Cider without the pressure. Maybe Rasmussen can take a step. I'm, I'm hoping. I don't know about a ninth overall pick and and where he's going to be. He's not going to be a frontline guy and don't expect too much from Joe Valeno. I don't know. Valeno's not going to be probably a number one center. Can be a solid number three. Absolutely. Maybe his offense takes a level that we, we don't see coming. Maybe it does. And now he becomes a number two. Who knows? But enjoy the process of seeing these guys come along and the trades that Steve's going to make because of all the cap room that he's got. Look into the future. 
It's not for now. Now isn't going to do it. You're not signing big name players for now. What's the use? But you may sign some quality guys like a guy like a Bobby Ryan or a Mark Stahl. They fit in very well. And boy, I watched Nemeth last night. Did he have a rough night? Oh my goodness. That was sad. But anyway, but guys like that who are coming on. So I just say, be patient. Enjoy it. Good things to come. Good things. Good fodder to talk about. Uh, no matter what they do and trades they make, just trust the process. So I wanted to circle back towards the foundation because Brad went into the hockey before I had a chance to ask this question, but that's okay. Um, what made you decide to start the fa- like start a foundation rather than you know just having this grief and want you know talking to people about it? What was what sort of drove you to be like okay, let's put structure behind behind this and, and start a foundation? I think it was the grief, probably, and the outlet, and wanted to keep Jamie's name alive. Uh, and I think for anyone who's passed, people don't know what to say. And I said, well, now is a little different, but early on, and for those who are listening, if you know someone's who's passed, um, whether it be from this or anything, uh, doesn't have to be just from addiction, substance use disorder, be from anything. And if you just went up to that person and said, there are no words, you're right. There aren't. But you're there and you feel the presence. And that's what's important. And then you can begin to talk about it. So I say to anyone to me, don't be scared to talk about Jamie. For me, and that's the foundation logo, the Jamie Daniels Foundation, jamiedanielsfoundation.org, and his logo is off a music note. Jamie loved music. The main argument we always had, Jamie and I, uh, he loved rap. And the main argument we had was that he would tell me that, that Eminem, Marshall Mathers, Marshall was more talented than Paul McCartney. And I, we'd have that argument lots. Okay. And the Marshall Mathers Foundation gave us $10,000 this year. So I'm not putting down what, what Marshall has done. And now more than a decade sober for him. So congrats to Marshall and everything he's done. So, and, and wonderful organization they're doing and how, what he's overcome and, and how talented he is. But Paul McCartney, I mean, the Beatles from our old time, but you know, it was going, um, through the grief and I, I saw a friend and again, it was after, talking to Craig at Custance and the word got out. And uh, then I was talking to a friend and she said, I think you need to start a foundation. And we talked about that. And I said, well, that's a lot of work. I mean, how do you even start that? She goes, let me introduce you to Larry Burns, who was Children's Hospital Michigan Foundation, now the Children's Foundation. And then he said, let me introduce you to Matt Friedman as well, Tanner Friedman, and who's on the board of the Children's Foundation. And they run our 501. So they run it for us. And that's what was necessary. And the ball just started rolling. And I, I mean, to, to get the number of people who come up to me and say, thank goodness for what you're doing. And it allows us to talk about it. Or you saved my son's life. You saved my daughter's life. And it's so true just because we started speaking about it. And I didn't know what to do, but there had to be a way to say Jamie's name without feeling as much grief as I'm going to feel for the rest of my life. I say in speaking engagements all the time, the brain isn't the only organ affected by opioids. It also breaks families' hearts. And there's a hole in our families' hearts that will never be filled, but this helps a lot. So starting the foundation was what we did, just a way to keep Jamie's name alive. Jamie loved to laugh. That's why. And Darren Pang is hosting our virtual roast with Brett Hull, which will probably be televised in November. The silent auction will be up, should be live um, probably late September or so, but on my Instagram account. We'll, we'll keep you up to date on that. And I was doing the uh, Washington Columbus series. So it would have been the year where Holtby did not start the first two games of that series, right? Was it Grubauer? Started the first. Yeah, two. 2018 against Columbus. Yeah, Washington won the cup. So Panger and I were working the games for NBC and I was meeting Darren for dinner. I never forget to the hotel and I had ordered steak. He said, I'm coming in. He had gone back to St. Louis and we were calling the game the next night and we're having dinner. And I said, how did it go? Because they were roasting him back in St. Louis, Kelly Chase, who hopefully will be a part of our event this year uh, for Brett Hull and Dennis Hull will be a part of it too. And um, Darren said they roasted me. It was hilarious. And I, I said, and then we got to talking. He said, what are you going to do for the foundation? And I said, I don't want to do a golf tournament. And Darren said, why don't you do a roast? And Jamie loved to laugh. All his laugh was infectious. And he thought I was hilarious, which I don't know. His dad maybe was biased, but we we laughed a lot. And I thought, that's it. 
And that's when it, that's how it came about. And I've never been more pleased with a decision than that. And, uh, that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. We have some listeners, you know, but, and they may not really know a whole lot about the foundation. So like when we first talked about this partner or partnership, I didn't really know a lot about it either. So the first thing I did was went to the website and went under the about us and read Jamie's story. And it, it was shocking to read. I had no idea things like this went on. So I totally suggest people take a read of it, you know, let it digest. Cause it, 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 it blew my, blew me away just reading it. But my last question I want to ask you was, what do you miss most about Jamie? Uh, well, and to your point, the E60, did you guys see the E60 that ESPN did on Jamie? If not, I'll send yeah. you guys the link. I can't send it to everybody, obviously, but I'll send you guys the link. And you we'll can put it in the, the description for everyone to see. It ran in April 18 um, that ESPN did, and uh, that helped a lot. What do I miss most about Jamie? Um, well, one, his laugh. Um, it's funny. When I, when I spoke at this foundation the other night uh, here in Detroit, and their son who had passed, just a couple of years ago and they started their own foundation. I spoke there a couple hundred people there and what they're doing is great. And when I saw the description of Alex and what he was like and met the family, it was the same thing as Jamie. Um, you know, his dad, John found Alex in the bedroom. I couldn't imagine finding my son that way. A Birmingham police officer knocked on my front door to tell me I couldn't imagine finding my son. And I said, at the end of the time, there are no words. I can't imagine. I couldn't. Um, just like you guys can't imagine for me. That's not no disrespect. You just can't until you've gone through that. But I miss most his laugh. Um, sure, he'd be a pain in the ass sometimes. And when he's going through his trouble, I'm going, who is this kid? Because you don't know. And if I only knew then what I know now, now I know to have empathy and not judgment. And empathy is the highest form of knowledge because it comes without judgment. And I wish more people had that. Um, I miss talking to Jamie after every game, virtually every game. We talk. We used at Michigan State. Uh, after graduating from Michigan State, you know, he'd follow the team. And I remember the last night I spoke to him was in Winnipeg. And I was talking with the guys uh, at dinner and Sarah Orleski, just a pregame meal. And we were actually talking about Jamie. And then they all heard a few days later and uh, all called me, Dennis Payak, everybody there, Brian Munns, everyone. And um, I talked to Jamie that night standing outside the Red Wing dressing room. And I called him. So, you know, even Winnipeg times a little earlier. So it's probably 11 back in, in Florida, uh, where he was. And he said, you guys had a rough game. And I said, no, we won. And he said, you won. What the hell happened? Cause we were losing early. And he, I said, where were you? And he said, I went outside to paint the wheels of my car black. You're going to love it. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm probably going to hate it. And he said, no, dad, seriously, you're going to love it. I'll take pictures when I get to work in the morning. He never woke up. And he took a pill later that night um, where someone in that house, I'm not saying he should have taken it, should have known. He knew, but he was on Xanax (laughs) because he got patient brokered and addiction doctor who was working for that house gave him that anxiety med. He shouldn't have. And he was feeling better about himself. So he took it and figured it wasn't going to kill him, even though he should have known to take nothing not absolving them. But the guy in that house had pills that was laced with fentanyl. And some kids who are addicted, they strive for the fentanyl. They strive for the high. But too much fentanyl will kill you. Pretty much any fentanyl can kill you. But unfortunately, addicts, if you tell them there's a drug dealer on the corner who's got fentanyl, they'll go there. They want that high. And if they hear a kid has died from that drug dealer, they'll still go, but they'll cut what they're using in half. That's how sad they are and those who are addicted. And just so people know, Those who are addicted and who get high keep getting high only because they don't want to be as sick as they've ever felt in their life. That's why we have to have empathy and can't judge. Just like alcoholism, you don't take a drink one day and go, I'm going to be an alcoholic. You don't take a pill one day where a kid introduced them to Jamie at Michigan State because a doctor prescribed it. Here, take a pill. Five days, Jamie was hooked. You don't know. You don't know how long it's going to be because the chemical receptors in your brain have changed. They're altered now. The cognitive ability to say no is gone. That's the problem. And when you get so high and you don't want to detox or you can't, your brain says, give me more, give me more. You're going to be so sick. You're going to want to die. You better use, you better use. And they use. 
That's why detox is so painful. Jamie went through all that. So Jamie took a pill from that house and when he passed and it's in the E60 story, um, they left him there for an hour while they cleaned up the house of drugs, knowing the police were coming. And then that kid who patient broker Jamie, who didn't admit to patient broker Jamie, but did others. And I know he did because Jamie was with him and he met him at the meetings and he told me he did. Uh, he then texted me a stream of texts, which we put together, um, basically to get Jamie's belongings back. He wanted money. And ESPN E60 found him in another state because he was scared of the people in the house. So he took off. So that's his story. So that's where we're at. And that's what I miss most talking to Jamie after every game, just about the game. And I think about him after every game. It's an incredibly poignant story and you're right that there's no way we could ever know. Um, but for you to come on and share, obviously, you know, makes a world of difference. Um, this is a note that was passed along, you know, obviously substance use disorder is often silent and that individuals are afraid to seek help because of the stigma. Knowing this, what final message do you have, Ken, for anyone listening right now that is experiencing an addiction and is struggling to seek help? Well, get help and it's a family thing. Don't hide it. I know you want to hide it from your friends, but you can go on our website. There are places to go. Family's got to be involved. And you have to go through that detox process. And it's, and it's not just you go through detox and then you go live. It's the rest of your life. It's just like alcoholism. It's anything. You're always going to be tempted and so many relapse and COVID and the isolation and the rates are way up in substance use disorder. It's a pandemic and this COVID pandemic has taken over that pandemic, but the COVID pandemic has exacerbated this pandemic. Believe me. And the numbers are way up for those who are dying, who have to go through teletherapy now, like we're doing uh, on this. And you don't have the meetings. You, you're in isolation. You don't have the camaraderie. You don't have the friends and the 12-step programs to go to, even though my son was patient brokered at one still. At the time he was there and having a sponsor, it helped. And now you're alone and you don't know where to go. So you need family. You need to seek help. And thank God to me at the time when Jamie said, Dad, I need to go to rehab. I said, I've never been more proud of you in my life. And he did. And he was clean for seven months until he left a safe house for the offer of cheap rent, 50 bucks a month, rather than close to a thousand a month he was paying. I was paying one of the weeks he was paying the rest because he was working. And you know, at 23, you guys know 23 year olds. I got it, dad. I got you. I got this. I'm good. You're not good. And you don't know. You just don't. And too many kids don't. So we need to talk about it. That's the message. And for anyone, your parents, your families, anyone who has prescription pills, oxycodone, Percocet, anything in your medicine cabinets, don't flush it because there's a big problem even up in Lake Superior and so much is going into the lake water now. People are flushing pills. That is not a good thing to do. Turn them into police stations. Get rid of them. There are disposal places. Phone. There are, are places to send pills. Get them out of your house because if you've got 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds coming over and the parents aren't home, let's see what dad's got from his knee surgery five years ago. And they're still there. And my son was hooked from a friend in a frat. He called me after Jamie died. I'll never forget with the team in Florida. He passed in December and it was February. And he asked me for forgiveness because he was suicidal because he was the one in his frat in Greek life, which I don't like, but that's just me, who started Jamie on the opioids. And at the time, Jamie had been on Adderall and he told us when he was clean in Florida that he faked the test from his doctor to get the Adderall because kids are under such pressure right now. So he felt anxiety, thought he was stupid, even though he was smart, he graduated from state with a 3.5, but thought he needed more time on tests in high school and then is on the Adderall. And then someone introduced you opioids, you're still on the Adderall. Then you sell the Adderall for the more expensive opioids. And then when you can't afford the opioids, you turn to heroin. The heroin's laced with fentanyl. Then you die. Jamie never shot up. Jamie was scared stiff of needles, but took pills. And ultimately, the one pill he shouldn't have taken was laced with fentanyl, and he died. So get rid. I say, ask 50 million questions before you get hooked on Adderall. Trust me. I don't like it. It's legal. The doctors prescribe it all the time. I wouldn't be on it. I'm telling you, for me, it's a gateway. That's just me. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I have my PWP. I'm a parent with passion. That's the only doctorate I got. I'm a parent with passion, a PWP. Get rid of the prescription drugs in your house. Get rid of them. That's how it can start. 
Ken Daniels, folks, um, incredibly powerful message here. Uh, like he's mentioned before, go to jamiedanielsfoundation.org. Learn more uh, about the mission that they're on. Learn how you can contribute. There's going to be no shortage of opportunities to work with this podcast to contribute. There's going to be no shortage of opportunities with the Red Wings and everywhere else where you can work and help support the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Um, also, and if you want more stories about Ken Daniels, and uh, the incredible tales of Mickey Redmond, Steve Eisman, Brendan Shanahan, the Detroit Red Wings. If these walls could talk, Detroit Red Wings stories from the Detroit Red Wings ice locker room at Press Box, Amazon, wherever you get your books, uh, give it a read. It is going to be a blast, we promise you. Ken, we can't say thank you enough. And the only other ask we can have of you is that we come back and do this again another time. We will do that. Uh, you guys, for everything you've done for us and even mentioning the foundation, uh, it's not lost on us, believe me. We truly appreciate it. And uh, go Canada, eh? And start opening up. Start opening up out there. My goodness, enough of that. Heard you guys Lord. couldn't golf. What the hell were you doing? And my, no. you know, my brother and sister are in Toronto, so I know, and I haven't seen them in over a year, and it's hard, and they can't come here, and uh, they don't love me enough to go back in quarantine for 14 days. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I hope we get back to normal soon. But anytime you guys need me, I'm here. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.